Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at money. So, okay, we've taken the last little bit. We've been discussing a lot about GDP, about our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. We're going to be taking a step away from it. We're going to be leaving that behind us for a while, but don't worry, right? Don't worry. Don't forget it. We will be coming back to it. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a step away we're going to be focusing on money, we're going to be focusing on bonds, we're going to be focusing on banks, this whole financial side of the economy. And then we're going to take all this and we're going to bring it back to our aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. But okay, for today, talking about money, what are we going to be taking a look at in this video? Well, we've got three big objectives. Our first objective is we want to be able to explain the three functions of money, right? So we're going to kind of define money. What is money? And that's actually a weird question because that's something where we're like, well, I know what money is. What do you mean? What is money? Well, okay, we're going to give it a pretty formal definition. And by giving it that definition, be able to say, hey, these things are money. Those things, uh, they're not money. Uh, well, from that there, we're also going to explain, we're going to be taking a look at a brief history of money. So the progression of money from just your simple metallic clippings or shiny pieces of rocks and metal to what we now have today of digital currency and digital money. So we'll uh, take a look at that progression through time. Finally, our final objective is to be distinguished between money, near money, and money substitutes. So, right, that seems like, well, that seems like a bunch of uh, similarities there. Well, we'll talk about what those are. And of course, what we'll need is our definition of money in order to be able to talk about that. So let's start off then by taking a look at our definition of money. That is, what is money? And the flip side of that, what isn't money? So let's take a look at our three functions of money. Okay, so we will say that money has three functions, and these three functions need to be satisfied in order for a certain item to be qualified as actually being money. And let's talk about what these three functions of money are. First is that this item needs to be a medium of exchange. And what do we mean by that? What do we mean by medium of exchange? Well, medium of exchange really means that it's something that we have to agree on that, hey, we're going to use this to exchange goods and services. I don't need to engage in barter. I don't need to say, hey, I'll give you this service if you give me that good, or I'll give you that good if you give me this service, or anything like that. No, nope, we've just come upon this agreed kind of thing, like, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks for that. And on both sides, we're like, yeah, $20. We both agree that that is something that we will exchange goods and services for. So we're happy with that, and we're good with that. With this, for something to be a medium of exchange, it needs to have a few kind of subcomponents to it. It needs to be easily identifiable. Easily identified. What else does it need? Uh, what else does it need? Well, easily identified, right? And with that, hey, $20 is $20. We can recognize that pretty easily. It's not like, oh, what's that? That's a weird looking $20 bill. I don't know if I'm going to accept that. No, no, we know what Canadian money looks like pretty readily. I mean, even most of us, we know what a lot of foreign money looks like pretty readily as well. Um, attached to this easily identified is that it must also be difficult to counterfeit. Right, so easy to identify legitimate currency. But it must be, of course, difficult to counterfeit, and thus, right, you could differentiate between legitimate currency and the false counterfeit currency. So second kind of uh, caveat we need for something to be a medium of exchange. We also need to have this item that we're using as money, that's a medium of exchange, to be easily transportable. Easily transported. That is, hey, if I want to go buy something, it's going to be able to, I can move it, right? I can take my money to where I need to buy it, and I can say, here you go, here's this money, give me the thing that I want. With that as well, so easily transported, it also must be easily divisible. 
That is, we must have a way to divide our money down into realistically divisible portions so that, hey, we can buy things that, right, we don't have necessarily the money for. Like if I only had a $100 bill and I wanted to buy a cup of coffee, well, I'm not out of luck. My $100 bill can be split into 100 $1 coins. And if I buy my $2 coffee, I can get $98 in change back. Right, if my hundred dollars was not divisible, if it was like, oh, sorry, that's you can buy a coffee, sure, but I can't give you anything back for that. Hundred is the smallest we go. Do you want fifty coffees? Right, we'd run into problems. We'd run into some frictions with our economy, with our ability to use this item as a medium of exchange. So the divisibility of our money is vitally important as well. Second function is that whatever we are utilizing as our item for money, it must also be a store of value. Store of value. And what do we mean by store of value? What that means is, okay, $20, we know that that has value. And we've, you know, as a society, as people, we kind of say, okay, I know about what $20 is worth. I know what I can buy for $20. I know if I got $20, what that would be worth to me. So, okay, there's an implicit, there's an inherent value in that money, in that amount. In this as well, is that we would expect this to be relatively constant through time. And I, I do mean relatively constant, right? We do know that even with mild inflation, that $20 value will be eroded, but it won't be significantly eroded over a short time period. I know that roughly... In a typical two-year period, what I can buy for $20 this year will be about the same as what I could buy for $20 next year. So in that case there, this item that I want to use for money needs to be a stable store of value. My final, my final function of money is that it must be a unit of account. Unit of account. Oh, that's not how you spell account. Account. There we go. And what we mean by unit of account is that it's the way that we do our accounting, right? It's the way that we measure prices. It's the way that we measure worth, um, wealth, value. All of that is being measured in this item. So, okay, here in Canada, right, we've slipped this in because it's just so easy to just slip in as we talk about it, is that, hey, medium of exchange, yes, the Canadian dollar here in Canada is a great medium of exchange. It's easily identified. It's very difficult to counterfeit. It's easy to transport, right? Even if we were transporting raw cash, it's still pretty easy to transport. And of course, it's easily divisible. We can divide it down at least digitally to the cent, but physically we can divide it down to five cent increments. And if you're paying with cash, you just round based off of that five cents. So yeah, down to five cents, very few things cost five cents or less. So we have easy amount of divisibility to hit all that. So great, Canadian dollar satisfies this medium of exchange. This store of value. Well, yeah, we talked about that, right? We know kind of implicitly what $20 is worth to us and we know the value of that. And farther, we know that this is relatively stable. $20 today is worth about the same as $20 to me tomorrow. It's a very stable store of value. It doesn't depreciate, it doesn't appreciate. I know what it's gonna be worth in the near future. Finally, unit of account. I go to the store, things are priced in Canadian dollars. I get paid, I get paid in Canadian dollars. Uh, the value of my net worth, that is calculated in Canadian dollars. Right, so in that case there, we have this consistency that hey, my medium of exchange, my store of value, and the way that I actually measure things is all the same item. And in this case here in Canada, being those Canadian dollars. So in that sense there with these kind of functions of money and that these three functions of money must be satisfied in order for an item to be considered money, the question typically comes up, right? We have this new realm we have in the world around us. We have this rise of cryptocurrency. And the question often comes up is, well, is cryptocurrency money, right? Is it money? Well, off the start, no, it's not. And farther than that, it has now actually been defined and been classified as a commodity. 
So similar to oil, similar to um, pigs or apples or any of the other kind of goods that we would buy and sell on commodity markets. So cryptocurrency has formally been classified as a commodity, not as a money. But why? Why would that be the case, right? And maybe often the type of cryptocurrency people are most familiar with is Bitcoin. Although there's many, many other alternatives out there. Well, let's talk about why Bitcoin does not satisfy the kind of functions to be say that, yeah, yeah, Bitcoin's money. Because no, it's not. So the first one is medium of exchange. Well, okay, we have our difficulty counterfeit. That's that's true. Um, with this, though, is that it's not always agreed upon as a medium of exchange. You have, sure, your certain situations that people are like, yeah, sure, I'll accept Bitcoin for that. I think even you had a case here a few years ago where a seller in the Capital Regional District was selling their house for Bitcoin. Um, so you have these cases where that arises, but keep in mind, you have these cases where this arises for almost any good or service. People are always willing to engage in barter. I will give you this much of this for that much of that, right? That doesn't all of a sudden make this item currency, doesn't make it money. It just means that we just engaged in barter. And so often with cryptocurrency, the cases where people say, look, it was used as a medium of exchange there. Well, yes, okay, it was used in that one occurrence, but hey, I've seen cigarettes used as a medium of exchange. That doesn't mean that cigarettes are counting as money. It just means that they were utilized as a barter system to trade goods and services for that time there. Okay, what about the second one, right? We've said, okay, cryptocurrency uh, doesn't really satisfy the medium of exchange. What about store of value? Well, here's the problem with cryptocurrency, primarily with Bitcoin. It's volatile. What is one Bitcoin worth to you today? What is one Bitcoin worth to you last year? What is one Bitcoin going to be worth in a year from today? Right? Given the volatility, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. You're not sure what you're going to be able to buy for one Bitcoin. Maybe you're going to be able to buy a lot, right? If it keeps kind of exploding the way that it has over the last few years. Or maybe, like we've seen in a few times, maybe it all of a sudden collapses. And if it all of a sudden collapses, well, that what you can buy for that one Bitcoin is drastically less. So it's not a stable store of value. It's very difficult to be able to say what one Bitcoin is going to be worth tomorrow, let alone in a year's time. So in that case there, it is not a suitable store of value. And finally, unit of account. Again, people make these arguments that, yeah, there are certain goods out there on the web that are priced in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. But generically speaking, it is not an accounting unit. It is not what people are paid in. It is not what we value or is not what we measure value or wealth in. Uh, only in the few one-offs is that actually the case. So we don't have it as a kind of mass unit of account either. So in this way here, we see that really these cryptocurrencies, they fail to meet our functions of money. They kind of satisfy our medium of exchange insofar that any barter good satisfies our medium of exchange. But they fail definitely at being a store of value, and they fail definitely at being a unit of account. So we see that really here in Canada, well, Canadian dollars are, of course, our money because they satisfy all three. And that actually brings up an interesting thing in what we we're just talking about. And that is here in Canada, our US dollars. Are U.S. dollars money, right? And, and this, is, this is a tricky question. Are U.S. dollars money? And you're going to be like, well, yeah, U.S. dollars are money. But okay, are U.S. dollars money in Canada? And the answer to that is no. U.S. dollars are money in the U.S., but U.S. dollars are not money in Canada. And, and let's talk about why. Are they a medium of exchange? Well, actually, quite a few businesses, especially in southern Canada and in tourism hotspots, they will post a static exchange rate. Like, hey, we will give you a buck fifty Canadian for a dollar US constant. We'll just take that. So, okay, yeah, based off of that, in many, many places, we do have a relatively static rate that we'll accept US dollars at in many Canadian tourism hubs, at least. 
So it's kind of leaning a lot more to being a medium of exchange. Is it a store of value? Well, again, yes, we know roughly what a U.S. dollar is going to be worth, what how much you can buy for, say, a U.S. dollar. Uh, our exchange rate with the U.S. dollar, um, with the U.S. economy, rather, is relatively stable, and the U.S. inflation rate is relatively stable. So between that, yeah, roughly 10 U.S. dollars today is worth the same as 10 U.S. dollars tomorrow next year. <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a store of value as well. Where, where we run into problems is that a U.S. dollar is not a unit of account in Canada, right? We do not measure Canadian goods and services in U.S. dollars. We do not get paid our wages in U.S. dollars. We do not work out our net worth in U.S. dollars. So in this sense here, U.S. dollars are not a unit of account. By not being a unit of account here in Canada, U.S. dollars fail to meet all three functions of money, and thus U.S. dollars are not considered money here in Canada. So all we have is money here in Canada. Satisfying our three functions is, of course, the Canadian dollar. So our three functions of money and a few little examples comparing between them. So, okay. Now that we kind of know what is money and what we would classify as money, let's go through a brief, a brief history, a brief history of money. And, and this really will be a brief history of money. Uh, there is a lot more that can be said to this. Um, some of it's kind of interesting depending on your take on it. But let's take a look at this brief history of money. And to be honest, this is a very Western focused history of money. Um, kind of looking at medieval Europe through to modern Western culture. So it definitely overlooks many elements of the historical growth of money in um, African countries, Arabic countries, um, Eastern countries as well. Uh, this, is, this is a really Western-focused history of money, unfortunately. And ultimately, that just goes back to a lot of our current economic system, a lot of our view of money and trade comes from that Western European history as well. So, okay, going way, way back, we began off with commodity money. And commodity money, this was just precious gems, right? Precious gems, stones. Um, in ancient Rome, it was iron even. Um, gold, silver, all of these different bits, just metallic money. And typically they were valued by weight and purity. So you'd expect some level of purity for the piece of silver that you would have, and the weight in silver determined how much it was worth. Some issues with it for a medium of exchange, well, it was difficult to transport, it was difficult to divide, and it turns out it was actually pretty easy to counterfeit as well. It was easy to take really pure gold, to melt it down, to add some impurities to it, and then get more as a result, right? You half the purity of it, and you doubled the amount of gold you had. So uh, there was a lot of issues that was run into with this early commodity money as a medium of exchange. But it was the best that there was at the time, and the closest we would have had to money. From here, in an attempt, and still underneath commodity money, in an attempt to kind of fix some of these problems with just, hey, silver or weight in silver, etc. being what our money is worth, we then moved to our coin money. So coin money. And in coin money, what this is, is it was metallic money, and it was often minted and verified by the king, or by the monarch, by the lord, by whoever was ruling over the land and issuing the money, issuing the coin. And in this here is, typically, the monarch would stamp their face onto the coin in order to verify its purity, right? So, boom, my face on that coin the fact that I have my face on that, I am verifying that this coin weighs so much and that it is X percent pure. And in that way there, hey, when you're going through exchange, you don't need to be skeptical of, is this coin actually pure silver? Is this coin actually worth this weight? 
hey, it has the king stamp on it. I can take it at face value. And that's actually where that saying even comes from, taking it at face value. It had the king's face on it. So I can take the king's face as kind of proof that it is some certain weight in silver and some certain purity of silver or depending on the precious metal used in the kingdom, right? Maybe it was gold, maybe it was iron, but that stamp of approval that boom, there we go. That is that we could take at face value its weight and its purity. Mind you, we still ran into trouble with counterfeiting. Um, there was many methods used to um, clip or to kind of shave off little bits of each coin. And you could take off just little bits off of each coin that you wouldn't notice on the coin itself. But you do this over 100, 200 coins and you have enough to get an extra coin out of it. So, okay, there were there were still some issues with counterfeiting. Uh, there were still some issues with uh, debasing the currency. That is really changing its weight, right? Taking little clippings off. Interestingly, again, some of our own history. If you take a look at, I believe, and I might be wrong with this, but I believe it's the dime. So the Canadian dime, that's our 10 cent piece. Uh, this is going to be my great drawing here. If you take a look at the dime around the outside of it, you'll notice it has these little raised bumps. The reason why it has these little raised bumps really of no purpose in today because a dime isn't worth anything in weight or purity. It's just worth 10 cents because we say it's worth 10 cents. But the idea being is that back in the day, you would have a coin and people would just shave off the edges as you go around, keeping it round, but they would just shave it off. Well, as you shaved it off, you'd also be shaving off these little nubs. And that is, if you shaved off a coin and those nubs were not there, well, you'd know that that now, if you were accepting this coin, you know it wouldn't be actually worth 10 cents. You know that somebody had altered it, they had taken off some of this weight, and so it'd actually be worth now less than 10 cents because it'd been debased. So a little bit of historical context that does actually carry forward in quite a few of our coins through to today. Okay. From here, what we ended up moving on to was paper money. And paper money, interestingly, is just a natural progression from this commodity money. And this is, hey, it was very difficult to go and buy something large with all of this silver or gold or iron. And primarily with gold, because gold is heavy. And so in this case here, what often end up happening is that goldsmiths, goldsmiths kind of acted as your early bankers to say, hey, we'll hold on to your gold for you. We'll keep it safe. We'll kind of have this insurance on it so that you're covered and you don't need to worry about someone breaking into your house and stealing it. No, no, no. It's in our safes. It's in our vaults. It is good. It is safe. And what we'll do is we will give you we will give you a receipt saying how much money you have, how much gold, how much weight of gold you have sitting in there. Well, based off of this, then every time you wanted to buy something, anytime you wanted to use your gold there, what you had to do is you had to take your receipt. You had to go to the goldsmith or your receipt, go back to the goldsmith, say, hey, look, here's my receipt for how much money that I have. Give me this gold. You would take that gold. You would bring it over to whoever you're buying from. Let's say Joe. You'd give your gold to Joe. Joe would say, hey, great, thanks. Here's that thing you're buying. And then Joe would take this gold back to the goldsmith to get a new receipt. And so, okay, rather circular in this sense here and a lot of transporting of the gold, taking it out. This is heavy and this is also risky, right? Every time you take this gold out of the goldsmith, out of the vaults, it's prone to being stolen. It's prone to being hijacked along the way. So what eventually became the norm was that, hey, as long as you trusted this goldsmith, you could just exchange receipts. You could just exchange receipts for the gold there. Say, okay, I'm going to sign over my receipt for X weight of gold to you. And in this sense here, we have the rise of paper money. 
Now the gold never actually changes hands. The gold just stays at the goldsmith's vaults, but the receipts move between people and people with the receipts signifying some weight in gold. Eventually what began to happen with this is we saw within the goldsmiths the rise of fractionally fractional backed banking. And this fractional backed banking system goes something along these lines. The goldsmiths noticed, okay, let's say this is all of their gold sitting in their vaults. So there we go. We have a pile of gold. They noticed that on any one day, well, we'd probably get an extra bar of gold coming in and we might have one, maybe two bars of gold going out. But end of the day, any given day, the ins and the outs roughly balanced each other. So that is really, they were looking at it and they were going, why? Why are we carrying around all of this gold in the vault just doing nothing when very rarely does it actually move? Very rarely any amount out is satisfied by the amount coming in. We just have this massive stockpile of gold that's doing nothing. So our goldsmiths then realized is that, hey, as long as they were never caught, as long as they were never all of a sudden massive withdrawal happening and they didn't have the stuff in their vault anymore, as long as that didn't happen, they could take the gold in their vault and they could lend it out. That is now all of a sudden when you put this bar of gold into the vault, well, the goldsmith might only keep some of this, right? Because, hey, if you ever asked for it back, asked for it back saying, hey, I want my gold back. Well, likely somebody else was depositing gold and they could just satisfy it in that way. So they could take, say, 50%, 80%, 90% maybe even of their vault gold and they could begin lending it out to other people. By lending it out to other people, now the goldsmith makes money by charging the depositor by saying, hey, you want to deposit gold with me? Well, I keep it safe, but that's a cost, so you're going to have to pay a fee for me to keep your gold safe. They also get to make money by charging the borrowers, the people they've lent gold out to. They get to now charge an interest rate. So now, through this fractionally backed banking system, by lending out their excess gold that was just sitting there, we've been able to make extra profits, make extra money for this banking system. It turns out with this as well, by lending this out, they're throwing extra gold out into circulation. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail later, but essentially this also increases the amount of gold in circulation. Because now some of this gold is circulating twice. Once as that receipt, and then once again as that loan. So we see this rise of this fractionally backed banking system as well. Which we'll come back to talking about a lot as we move on into talking about banking. But that's where we first kind of saw it pop up. Well, from this, well, these goldsmiths were making lots of money. And we began to move towards then, hey, and so the goldsmiths doing it, we move towards this gold standard. And the gold standard was really as we see it was that, hey, now all of a sudden, instead of us just going through receipts from the goldsmith, taking all your gold money, gold coins, and putting them on deposit with the goldsmith to get a receipt. Now the government's like, how, actually, how about we do this? How about we as the government issue paper money and we hold on to the gold in our vaults in the central bank or in some kind of bank, and we'll say that every dollar is worth X amount weight. This here, actually, interestingly enough, is goes back all the way to 1917 and is actually this whole idea kind of attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. And those of you who might know, Sir Isaac Newton, that's the same guy who Apple fell on his head, kind of discovered the idea of gravity and all of the like. Many of the great thinkers, many of the great scientists of the time back in that time were multifaceted in their studies, multifaceted in their disciplines, 
And he also served as the head of the mint, the British mint at that, well, not at that time, but in 1717. So at this time here, before the adoption of the gold standard, there were many different currencies in many different countries that were all backed off of weight of different precious metals and of different weights too, right? So it might be a French franc was worth so much of this kind of precious metal, but a German mark was worth a different weight of the same precious metal. And so it was very difficult to work out these international exchange rates because they were all different weights. They were all different precious metals. Um, for example, right, still to this day, the reason why we call it a British pound sterling is because it goes back to the fact that a British pound sterling was a pound of sterling silver. That's what its worth was attributed to. So when we adopted the gold standard, this allowed for a great ease of international trade in an era of rising globalization, right? This was the era of colonialism and rising global trade, global commerce, and like we said, globalization. So the gold standard and saying, hey, we're going to base all currencies off of how much gold you have, and the weight in gold is going to be worth what that is worth. It allowed great and easy trade. Okay, then we hit World War One. In World War One, uh, let's make some room there. Um, oh, 1917. Sorry, that's that's the that's the wrong date. They did not come up with the gold standard in 1917. I, Isaac Newton was not alive at that time. Ah, uh, this was Isaac Newton came up with this in 1717. Sorry. So the gold standard went along and went along for about 200 years until World War I. Now, World War I, we had all of a sudden huge pressures. This put massive pressures on the gold standard. Um, wars are expensive, right? And if the amount of money that you have is limited by the amount of gold you have in your vaults, it becomes very difficult to issue new money, to pay your soldiers, to pay your suppliers for the war effort, to buy more food, to buy more ammunition, to buy more equipment. So in World War I, uh, the gold standard was abandoned. It was abandoned briefly. It was briefly abandoned. Um, then during the interwar period, we put back on to the gold standard, and then we had... Bretton Woods, uh, 1944, and the Bretton Woods Agreement with the U.S., it went and, let's say here, 1944 was a re-adoption, re, uh, it helps if I can spell, re-adoption of the gold standard. Again, that was Bretton Woods. And this here, it said, okay, we're going to re-adopt the gold standard globally, and we're going to peg the price of gold to $35, 35 US dollars. So, sorry, let's do that properly. 35 US dollars per ounce of gold. And this here was a way to stabilize exchange rates. We now knew, okay, if an ounce of gold was worth 35 US dollars, then, okay, depending on how much gold we have and how much money we have, we can work out what one of our dollars is worth, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Ultimately, ultimately, the gold standard was abandoned in 1971. This fell apart, and come 1971, we saw the end of the gold standard. We saw the end of that altogether. In fact, in Canada, we abandoned the gold standard in 1940 before Bretton Woods. We never signed on to the Bretton Woods Agreement, although we had a good long period there where we pegged our Canadian dollar to the U.S. dollar. So, okay, we weren't formally part of Bretton Woods. We never formally were part of the gold standard since 1940. But by pegging ourselves to the U.S., uh, we kind of were. Uh, 1971, though, is when we kind of formally, many, many countries began to walk away from this gold standard. The last country, and today there's no country in the world with the gold standard, uh, the last country to back their money by gold was the Swiss franc, and they walked away from this in 2000. So for the last 20, what, no, 21 years now, we have had no 
no economy in the world that has backed their currency by gold. So where are we now? Well, going through our history of money, so commodity money, paper money, onto the gold standard, we now have what we call fiat money. And that is now $20 is worth $20 because the government says it's worth $20. There is no weight in gold backing that $20 to determine its value, to determine its worth. It's worth it just simply because it's decreed to be worth it. There's just a legal decreed value. Um, this here would be fiat money. This is fiat paper money as well as fiat coin money. That was a terrible writing. Uh, fiat coin money. And that is, right, in a nickel, there is actually no weight of nickel in a nickel that makes it worth five cents. Um, right, as you go on through your other forms of coin money, there's no actual weight of precious metal determining their worth. They're strictly worth five cents, 25 cents, a dollar, two dollars, because we've decreed it to be the case. Same with paper money. There's nothing, you cannot redeem. Your paper money is not a receipt that you can bring back to the Bank of Canada. It's not like you can bring 50 bucks to the Bank of Canada and they'll give you an ounce of gold. Nope, nope, that is done, that is gone. Um, that used to be the case, mind you, before 1940. There would be on the on all paper money, would say redeemable for gold at the Bank of Canada. Now, no, now that's not the case. It is now strictly, this is $20 because we have decreed it to be the case. As we move forward through time, we can add on to this still a little bit more. And we can add on now our kind of current state, which is our e-money or our deposit money. This is the fact that, hey, most of us, when we go buying stuff, when we go and engage in our day-to-day -day activities, very rarely do we actually deal with physical paper, physical cash, or coin. Most of the time, what we deal with is just electronic funds transfers through our debit cards, right? We just say, okay, I have a bunch of numbers on a software program saying this is how much money I have, and I can just transfer the numbers out of my account into your account. And so we see this rise of electronic banking, um, which really just gets rid of those frictions, gets rid of that difficulty in transferring wealth, transferring money between one person and another, or between one business and another. So really to kind of summarize our history of money as we've moved through it, we've gone from the start where we've attributed value, we've attributed money, this medium of exchange, this store of value, this unit of account to precious metals. And we've determined it based off of weight and purity. From there, we kind of were overcoming issues with it, overcoming issues of counterfeit, um, counterfeiting, overcoming issues of weight and transportation by ultimately adopting coins and then paperback money by transacting in receipts. Still to overcome kind of counterfeiting and not sure if you can trust a goldsmith and the receipt that's issued by that goldsmith, we moved to the gold standard where now the sovereign, the sovereign ruler, the government issued the money and said, hey, we have the gold, and this money is worth this much because we have this much gold. And every one of these bills in circulation is now worth X ounces of gold. And then it has its value in that way. As we move forward through time, A, due to pressure is being put on the gold standard, but also kind of attached to it is kind of realizing that, well, hey, gold only has value because it's pretty and we think it has value. Why do we have to have this step removed between our money and what the actual value thing is? If we're just decreeing value to gold, why don't we just decree value to currency itself? And so since 1970, uh, if you're talking about Switzerland, since 2000, but really for quite a while now, most countries have abandoned the gold standard and we're just in this fiat money. Money is just worth something because we say it's worth something. In more recent years, we've even begun to move away from physical cash and towards electronic money, digital money, that is just the money held digitally in the spreadsheets reported to us uh, by the banks. And there are few countries around the world that are presently playing around with the idea of becoming a completely cashless society that is moving entirely into this digital currency world. 
So a little bit of a history of money there. And we see where we're at today. A little bit of fiat money. That's our physical cash. Mostly digital money. Mostly digital. We are in a mostly deposit economy with very few actual floating around cash currency. Okay. So that's a bit of our history. The last thing we wanted to talk about then was, okay, we had our three functions of money. We've seen how these three functions of money have evolved over time. Well, not really um, evolved over time, but how money has evolved over time to better satisfy, to be able to e more easily satisfy these three functions, eliminating a lot of the frictions in them. Again, what were these? These were a medium of exchange. medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Uh, I don't know why this is so hard for me to write. Account. Okay. So what we want to talk about next then is with these functions of money, and really with the rise of digital money and e-money as we're really seeing this more and more, is we have money, but then we also have what we would call near money and money substitutes. And so what exactly are these near money and what exactly is this money substitute? Well, let's start off for a second by just taking this unit of account for granted. Let's just say, yes, we're in Canada. Yes, we're going to measure our value in dollars, Canadian dollars. So we're going to say that, hey, this unit of account, that just universally applies to both. Okay, so what is near money? What is a money substitute? Okay, well, near money is an item that is a store of value, but is not... A medium of exchange and what is, what is that what is that what is something that would be a store value but not a medium of exchange well these would be a lot of our deposit accounts that are semi locked in right so for example if you locked in a bunch of money into a one-year term deposit hey here's ten thousand dollars give me a one percent interest rate and I know that next year I'm going to have $10,100. So, right, in that case there, it's a good store of value. I know that, hey, okay, I have this money. I've locked it in for one year at 1%. I know what it's going to be worth next year as well. However, it's not a medium of exchange. You cannot go and just sign over this term deposit to somebody else. In the same way, we could look at a lot of, say, government bonds, corporate bonds, money market mutual funds, money market accounts of the like, right? If you're in the financial world, you'll understand what those mean. Uh, if you're not too sure, don't, don't get too worried about that. Uh, the financial instruments I'm referring to are not vitally important. The fact is, is that those instruments I talked about there, they're a store of value. They're pretty stable. They're not volatile. You know how much money you put in, and you're expecting roughly the same plus an appreciable amount of interest in the future. So they're stable, they're a store of value. At the same time, you could not go to the car dealership and say, hey, I'm going to sign over X many dollars of money market mutual funds to buy my car. They would look at you and they would say, sorry, sell it, get cash. And that's the big thing with this near money. It's a store of value, you know what it is, it's decently liquid, that is you could very decently quickly convert it back into cash that's what we mean by liquidity is how easily it could be converted into cash but it itself is not a medium of exchange you would need to liquefy it you would need to turn it into cash first okay well, what about a money substitute money substitute is the opposite of that a money substitute is a medium of exchange but it is not, um, let's go back, it is not a store of value. So what is this? What is something that would be a medium of exchange, but in itself not a store of value? Well, keep in mind we're taking this unit of account for given, so that is we are talking about Canadian dollars. 
So something that's Canadian dollars, we can use it to buy and sell stuff, but these Canadian dollars that I have are not worth anything. They're not actually a store of value at all. What, what, what's this? Well, this is going to be a situation like our revolving credit. And the type of revolving credit that you're most familiar with is, of course, your credit cards. Right? In the sense that, hey, you might have 10,000 available to you on your credit card. That'd be, right? That'd be a huge amount. Don't Please don't kill yourself and bury yourself in that kind of debt. That'd be insane, especially with credit card at 20% interest rate. But say you had that 10,000 available to you. Well, that's not actually any value. That's not actually $10,000 that you have available to you. It is $10,000 you can utilize as a medium of exchange, but it is $10,000 that you ultimately need to take your own money and pay back off in the future. So it is not a store of value if you even had $20 on your credit card. That's not a $20 limit. That's just money for you. That's $20 that you can use as a medium of exchange, but then you would have to use actual money to pay back. So your credit card, these kind of loans, all of those, those are money substitutes. They're not in themselves money because that whole process, that's not a store of value, right? There's no value in that in itself. It's just you're using somebody else's. So difference there between near money and money substitutes. Okay, so in this lesson, what have we done? We've taken a look at our three functions of money. We've looked at the distinction between money substitutes and near money, and we've taken a look at the brief history of money, um, differentiating that, hey, as we move through time, we began with these precious metals until we get to today, where ultimately money is only worth something because we declare it to be worth something. And that's really the big takeaway with that, is that money is fiat. Money has no explicit value. There's nothing explicitly behind a dollar that makes it worth a dollar. It's only worth a dollar because we have said it's worth a dollar. So that there being the big takeaway in that case. Okay, if you have any questions about today's video, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can either post on the comments below. You can leave a comment on the D2L Frequently Asked Questions page. Or, of course, you can feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.